Welcome to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. I'm Amanda. And I'm Elizabeth. Thanks for joining us today. Welcome back to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. Today we have with us Dr. Joe Luck. He's an associate professor in biological systems engineering at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. And we are lucky to have him in Ohio today. He was one of our speakers at Precision U in London talking about his nitrogen work with making in-season decisions using sensors. So why don't you just give us a little background on um, what you've been working on uh, at the University of Nebraska Lincoln and um, kind of where you came from because you um, originated not too far from Ohio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually grew up in uh, western Kentucky on a small uh, grain farm there. I uh, went to the University of Kentucky all all through school. Um, ended up fish- finishing up there in early 2012, and so I've been out in Nebraska for about seven years now. And uh, a lot of the background that I did uh, research on back then was related to spray application technology. <clears throat> and so at the University of Nebraska, I still do a lot of work along those lines. Um, We've got a project right now we're working on uh, technologies to mitigate spray drift um, and um, application accuracy uh, assessment for spray systems, things like that. And obviously with the precision ag focus, you have to end up doing a lot of field work, you know, demonstrating a lot of technology. So we've had some really fun projects the last couple of years. We've been experimenting with multi-hybrid planters and using that for corn um, hybrid tests and soybean treatment tests, which was kind of uh, a neat project. And we've, um, uh, you name it, we've been involved in harvest logistics projects, just data management topics in general. And then the, the project that I kind of talked mostly about today here at Precision U, which was uh, what we call Project Sense. Um, Sensors for Efficient Nitrogen Use and Stewardship of the Environment is the acronym for that. I didn't know if I'd be able to get all that out. Uh, that that was a three-year project, and so and I'm I'm just one member of a, a team. We have about ten or twelve people that have been on that team: um, agronomy, ag economics, engineering, um, extension, other extension folks um, working on that project, and so. Yeah, we, we started that project with uh, the Nebraska Corn Board and then support from five of our natural resource districts that do a lot of water management and regulation out there in Nebraska. And so the goal of that project, you know, was to to try and push the envelope in terms of nitrogen use efficiency. Um, a lot of our growers do a great job managing nitrogen, but uh, even moving to like split application where you know you're putting your base rate on at or before planting and then you're coming back in season we were still kind of seeing people reach a maximum value that they could hit with nitrogen use efficiency and weren't really able to push any further so uh, dr richard ferguson the agronomist kind of led the first few years of the project um, we kind of put this idea together about doing a big demonstration project with crop canopy sensors so you're doing split application, but then you're adding sensors into that to help drive management, so. Yeah, I thought the data that you shared was really interesting. Um, It's the first time I've really seen a lot of that research being done because your sensors are mounted on the boom and it's real time analyzing that data and then making the application, is that correct? Yeah, that's, I think that's one of the unique things about you know, there's three commercially available systems that can do this as, as far as I know today. Uh, Ag Leader, Topcon, and uh, Trimble all have solutions for that. And yeah, you know, you're you're mounting this onto a high clearance, app. it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a high, high clearance applicator, it could be a spray application system, you know, that could get over V8 corn or something, V10 corn. But yeah, you're, you know, you're monitoring the crop uh, and applying and making that nitrogen decision as you go in the field based on, you know, how the, um, the reflectance state is coming back from the corn plants. So. so it works based off of a vegetative index, right? So there are a lot. I think most commonly we hear about NDVI. Um, what one does this system use and what makes it different from 
the others? Yeah, so the, the system we worked with is the one from Ag Leader. So I, I call it the Optrix, OPTRX system. And um, yeah, there's like a hundred different vegetation indices. It's it's crazy, but NDVI is a very popular one. We use NDRE, so the red edge, normalized difference red edge. And that's the one that the Ag Leader system typically uses. It can switch back and forth. I think most of them can switch back and forth between. One of the issues out in, at least especially out in our way, is once corn gets to a certain growth stage, uh, you need an NDRE. It has a little bit more spread in terms of the, the, the rates, ranges you get from that, whereas the NDVI kind of saturates and you don't get a lot of rate changes. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's a process by which, you know, you go out and you scan a part of the crop. It, it sets, you know, its reference VI, reference vegetation index, and that's kind of the healthiest. It considers that the healthiest corn, probably not nitrogen limited. That's the hope. And then as you're out, you know, after that, you put the system in application mode. And as you're going out applying to the rest of the field, it's scanning the rest of the crop in real time, you know, comparing that back to that reference uh, scan, applying an algorithm. And in real time, you're getting nitrogen rates based on that reflectance data. And you mentioned that these sensors can pick up that difference in the color, I guess, um, about a week before we can with our eye, with the human eye. Yeah, I mean, we you, know, you kind of think about what level of uh, nitrogen efficiency, but we there were clearly times when we would look at a corn plant when we were out in the field and, or an area and say, well, I don't see any deficiency there. Well, when you go out and scan it and you can compare that to some of the other corn, you definitely see that deviation from the reference value. So that just tells you that this these systems are, are able to detect that much quicker than we can. Mm -hmm. That's really important when you're looking at over the canopy a lot of times by the time we can see a color difference it's a little bit too late to maximize yield. Yeah and that's you know that's kind of some of the side data sets that we're working with as a result of this project is you know we have you know what they call it sufficiency index that's your ratio of the corn that you're scanning and applying to back to that reference value and uh, you know we can look at you know what was our sufficiency index at the time of application um, and, and we're breaking down the data now to see you know what what you know which it's I think some of the previous research would indicate you know 0 0.95 0 0.9 that's that time when that sufficiency index you're starting to see the stress to get that application on um, we'll have a great data set to compare that to and say you know if you see plants that are point eight five it's you know you better be out there getting that nitrogen on as opposed to you know right now the recommendation is to go in at v8 or to v12 well you could actually do some you know preliminary data analysis and figure out i need to be out there now or wait i can wait a little longer so that's really interesting so when you're making these applications what's the range of rates of nitrogen that you're typically working with are you seeing a, the ability to reduce total rate yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, the system, when we used the system, our growers asked us, the consensus was, even if the sensor would say no nitrogen, we would still put on 30 pounds per acre. So there were a lot of instances over the course of three years where the system would show a minimal rate. Well, we would, we would go ahead and put on some nitrogen. Um, our rate ranges, I'll have to think about the number, Basically, with the 32% UAN, we would be somewhere between 8 gallons per acre up to 60 gallons per acre. Um, quite commonly, in I think 8 to 48, we felt like, you know, 80% of the time or so we were within that window, which is a lot. I mean, that's a quite a range. And so we, you know, we've tried to put out a little bit of guidance on, you know, other technologies to adopt maybe parallel with that system to help with those rate changes because... Uh, you know, if you're using fixed orifice nozzles and, and you're having to make that wide of a change, you're, you're going to have to speed up or slow down to let those systems reach those low and high mm -hmm. rates. So, yeah, that's just a little bit of extra information you learn as you're out working with these systems that, you know, you don't necessarily are, are told about kind of from the beginning. So, Yeah, that's the things you don't think about, the challenges of, of the equipment, even as easy as things are today, there's still, still things we have to think about. That's right. 
So let's get into a little bit of the actual management of this. So if a farmer wanted to do this, what are some key pieces that they need in order to implement a trial of their own? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, the biggest thing is the investment cost. I mean, and I think that's one of the, the things that uh, we were able to bring to this uh, through acquiring funding to do this demonstration because not everybody can just go out and pick up you know a sixteen twenty thousand dollar system but you know what I tell people is uh, if you have a GPS you know spray rate G GPS driven spray rate controller um, you can probably add one of these systems on for about sixteen to twenty thousand dollars so between the sensors cables modules monitor um, you know it can plug right in and, and basically you know it, it does all the processing, you know, particular like the one from Ag Leader, for instance. Um, so, you know, you need to have uh, if you're going to try something like that, you got to have time because it does take a little bit of time to set up, and then. Um, but really, you know, when it comes to application, you know, that five minutes in terms of scanning that initial time, that's really all the pre-field application work you have to do. You know, at that point, you're just out applying. You know, you can use. This system on a 120 foot sprayer if you want to i mean so the idea i think these companies would would say is you know you're not hopefully not slowing down if you're doing in-season nitrogen application so i think uh, you know from that perspective it's a pretty good system another thing with these active we call these active crop canopy sensors because all three of those systems have their own light source so you know you could be out applying after dark and still have the same data if we think about satellite plane based or maybe uav based imagery you know that relies on sunlight which limits us in terms of the time we can get out and do that data collection so that's kind of a few benefits i think of these systems that don't really get um, promoted all the time but yeah i hope you have a video somewhere of running this at night i'd like to see yeah, that that would be cool <laughs> we may have to put that on our to-do list <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, yeah we we had several late night uh, late evening applications so i think that'd get picked up on twitter it'd be the videos where they mm -hmm. use fire to kill weeds <laughs> this would be right up there in popularity i'm sure <laughs> So when you're laying out a um, treat or a plot plan, what does it look like? You've got your nitrogen-rich strip. Um, what else do you need to include? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the biggest two things, um, well, there's a couple keywords I always come back to. One is uh, replicated field strips. You always want to have, you don't want to just do one pass of, you know, whatever treatment. And then, you know, the other term is randomization. So you want to build, you know, this uh, alt this not constant alternating, you know, mm -hmm. test strip across the field. So for our project, what we did was we had, you know, our, our grower, whoever we were working with, had their management technique in the first strip. And then we would have this sensor-based technique, which would be, you know, 75 or 100 pounds at planting followed up by that in-season application V8 to V12 and we would replicate that six times across the field and then uh, we would not we would change the order of those up you know so it was not always grower sensor grower sensor it was you know mixed up um, and then we typically you know would throw in a high nitrogen strip I mean if you can if you can deal with it sometimes a zero nitrogen strip is mm -hmm. not such a bad idea uh, just to see where you're at in terms of uh, uh, economic optimum nitrogen rates, but uh, the the main two comparisons there were our sensor based management versus the grower, and so again those were six field length strips of each, you know, so we had a really nice size data set. I mean, you know, we, we're not exactly doing small plot research with this. It was 500 acres a year, you know, over the over about 15 or diff or so fields. So. Okay. So looking at those trials, do you, are you seeing a difference? Is there a winner between a typical grower strategy and this sensor-based approach? Yeah, we, if you look at all the fields, so we ended up with 48 um, field sites that we felt like, you know, were within the scope of what we were trying to do. Um, everything went a, a fairly well according to schedule with weather and different issues. Um, Two-thirds of the fields actually saw a better profitability, of course, over a range, better profitability and better nitrogen use efficiency using the sensor-based approach. Um, 
another 21 percent so this is about you know 80 83 85 percent total another 21 percent had better nitrogen use efficiency but not quite as good profit the profitability wasn't there with the sensors um, and that's just based on the cost of the cost and amounts of nitrogen the cost the price and the amount of yield and then for about 15 percent of the sites the growers that we were working with did better in both cases they were doing better nitrogen use efficiency and better profitability so it's like every other technology it's you know there's <clears throat> there's fields that it's going to work in there's years it's going to work in better than others but by and large i feel like that's a pretty good indication that there's a lot of opportunity for this you know um especially when you have a lot of infield variability in say organic matter or terrain or maybe soil texture um, things that can affect nitrogen availability so areas that can leach nitrogen areas that can mineralize nitrogen things like that that infield variability i think is where these sensors are going to have their most opportunity to pay back you know as opposed to a, a fixed rate approach and it's always interesting, you know, we all, I don't know, I, would, I used to always focus on the yellow corn. You know, we would show these pictures and I'd see, you know, oh, look at that yellow corn. You know, I'm really saving a lot or whatever, making it back. But it's, it's really the healthy corn in the field. Those areas where the crop is really in good shape at the time of application, that's where the sensors are cutting back on nitrogen because they, based on the internal algorithm, it's, it's saying that corn is not limited. It's probably got enough nitrogen to make it through the rest of the season. So it's going to cut back and those are the areas where you're really saving money so yeah i mean there's so much variability from season to season so we've seen these trials where zero nitrogen strip might yield 180 bushels per acre is it going to do that every year no but maybe implementing the sensor technology we can take advantage of those years if we make a little bit later application and can cut back in those areas where we have high organic matter and uh, are able to support it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the infield variability piece is critical too. I know in, in some of our trials, we see a range within a couple hundred feet in a zero strip from 60, 50 <clears throat> or 60 bushel per acre up to nearly 200. So being able to get to a finer resolution of managing that is going to, I think, make a big difference in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, a lot of uh, a lot of imagery is getting pretty cheap. I know a lot of the plain based imagery that we have out in Nebraska, I mean, you can enroll fields for not too much. You know, if you just had a, a good image in DVI or in DRE at that, you know, V8 to V10, you probably have a pretty good idea of what your nitrogen variability might be. And then, you know, a grower does that a couple years and says, you know, I might have enough variability here to really make something like this pay. Um, of course, soil sampling and stuff, if you've been doing grid soil sampling, then you probably have a pretty good idea maybe of organic matter distribution and soil texture. So I think that's one of the things we're working on right now is because it's just a huge data set. But uh, all the data we've presented up to this point has been you know based on those field length averages so it's grower versus the sensor based approach but now what we're trying to do is dig in a little deeper look for where were the big wins what what was really the the cause or, or maybe what contributed to that um, maybe what were some of the losses that we saw where the uh, sensors weren't doing so well and you know if we can just get that information out there people can maybe make more better informed decisions so I know I hate hearing you talk about it because it makes me jealous that it's not my project. <laughs> you guys have some really fantastic work going on over there in Nebraska. I know this would be great to have in the e fields report, yeah. right? Well, it's been it's been a big undertaking, and, and you know we had we had a lot of support. And of course, I don't I don't mention the folks that actually worked at the NRDs, their field techs that you know were regularly out there helping us. And you know we had just two we had a phenomenal technician and student worked on the project the second two years and uh, if it had been all me it would have been a lot different project it would not have been as good but we had a great uh, and can and will continue this this work will continue for another couple three years um, a great team that's really uh, working hard on it and so I think it's <clears throat> it's been one of the best projects I've had the opportunity to work with it's some really good stuff I think it's it's really impactful it's something that matters to farmers and environmentally, I think we're going to have to start learning to tighten our belts on nitrogen before we're forced to. So I think this kind of work is critical. 
Yeah, and that's one of the things that's just been really fun is, you know, we didn't have a lot of people uh, uh, go out and adopt, which that, I mean, that wasn't our necessary, our goal was to get people to go out and buy these systems. But one of the things that's been really good is just to have that conversation about nitrogen use efficiency with people. And so we've even, you know, we, we've been ha- had meetings with just consultants that might work with 20 or 30 growers, and we're showing them the the you know pounds per nitrogen per bushel of grain that you you know we've been raising really good corn with and they want to show that to some of their growers because they're like we need to show them that you don't have to put on a you know 200 pounds to get 200 bushels you know you can i mean in a lot of cases you can get away with a lot less than that some in some cases we were putting on 100 pounds or less and i mean in some some research plots you put on like you said zero and you end up with 170 200 bushels yeah. don't put on any nitrogen in some years so it's been um, it's been good from that standpoint. You know, <clears throat> half the grow a lot of the growers we worked with uh, a few of them for all three years, a few of them for two. You know, um, most most people were with us at least two years. Uh, it's been fun. You know, they the feedback from them. Half of them have, have reduced nitrogen rates across the course of the project, and um, to me, that's a win. You know, you're just getting people to to see that they can don't have to put as much out there to to get it to get the crop and so on average if we average all of our sites together and of course a lot of it you know corn price and nitrogen price changed throughout the three years so we started out at 365 corn and 65 cents a pound nitrogen we ended up at i think 305 and 41 cents a pound Um, the if you look at those higher prices for both you know, the return from the sensors overall, the whole project was about $14 an acre. That, that's how much in, in increased profit you could have. If you look at the lower numbers, it was down more around 7 or $8 an acre. So that, that's another thing to really think about is that price of nitrogen and, the, of course, the yield price is a big factor in getting people to think about, you know, adopting these technologies. When, when nitrogen is cheap, it's tough to convince people to, you know, adopt a technology that's going to save on nitrogen. But... Like you said, uh, Elizabeth, I think we, we need to prepare people for how are they going to be able to push the envelope down the road to get, get lower numbers on some of that stuff. You mentioned that sixteen dollars to $20,000 uh, for the system. You have some um, information on the payback period depending on acre coverage. Mm-hmm. So obviously the more acres you can cover <clears throat> the quicker the payback period, but why don't you share a little bit on that? Yeah, that's a good, good question. If we use the, uh, the averages across all uh, three years, so this, this average and, and thinking about year-to-year average in prices, it was more like $9 an acre was your savings or so. Um, if, you, if you could run that system at about $16,000 investment price, over something like 1,300 acres, and this is just based on our data that we collected, irrigated corn, you know, this 1,500 acres. Essentially, if we had that 1,500 acres back, we could pay that system off in the first year. Oh, wow. And that's what it, you know, it's, yeah. it's about the break-even acres uh, at $16,000 investment cost that the numbers we found was about 13 or 1,400 acres. You know, you start spreading that over multiple years, you know, you get down to 500 acres you only have to run it three years so i mean you can kind of it's, it's not exactly a linear relationship but you know you if you could run it seven years you only have to run it over about you know 150 200 acres a year and you pay it off and then once you hit that payoff point from then on that's money in the bank you know yeah. so again it's like everything else you know the more acres you can spread it over the more potential for you know getting that cost back so have you seen any adoption from custom applicators we have not, and really, that's the <clears throat> that's the target audience we're looking at right now. Trying to talk more to the retailers, the co-ops, and the private applicators. You know, when we sat down with our growers, kind of at our end of the project meeting, you know, we just asked them what are the biggest barriers here, and of course, it was mostly cost. Mm-hmm. Um, the second, or what, well, I think associated with cost is the availability of that high clearance applicator to be able to get in the field and do that work at that time. You know, a lot of people are out spraying beans and they can't, you know, they can't get in and do nitrogen. So um, that's where we're at as well. Would they pay somebody 10 or whatever, 14 $15 an acre to come out and do that if they knew they could cut back on nitrogen? And so there's some discussions to be had there. I mean, of course, um, 
you know, the folks that sell nitrogen might not want to cut back on yeah. sales too much. But, but I think overall, I mean, the folks out in Nebraska we've talked to, they recognize that this is something that needs to happen. You know, we can't, we can't just keep throwing nitrogen out there forever. And um, so that's kind of where we're going is trying to touch base with more of those folks, see if we can't encourage them to adopt. We obviously share all the lessons we learned the hard way, some of them, you know, and, and share that with them early up, up front so that, you know, they'll be able to kind of hit the ground running and, and hopefully make really good decisions when they're out using it. So, Yeah, I think, you know, you guys have a little bit more struggle with groundwater nitrate but in Ohio we've pushed phosphorus so much because that's what's been visible but when we think about the Mississippi River and the eutrophication down um, down there in the Gulf um, I I just get concerned that it's not going to be too long before they start pushing back and that's gonna hit a lot of a lot more of Ohio than uh, just the Northwest area so I mean, it co it's cost savings to cost cut back on nitrogen, but also, like you mentioned, the environmental impact can be pretty significant as well. Yeah, it's tough to put a number on that right now, but we, we know it's coming. I mean, the you know the folks that have tile drainage or seem like they're really getting hit hard with you know with people looking at, at tile uh, effluent. You know, we folks out our way might have to monitor irrigation water every year for nitrate levels so that that's a you know and, and that's a problem those wells are deep so that's been you know this is maybe years from a solution but that's the way we look at it is just trying to get information out there now for people to maybe make better or make better decisions in the long run you know to to help out not only the economic situation but the environmental situation too yeah hopefully this is something we can kind of be ahead of rather than trying to play catch up in some areas. Yeah, and there's <clears throat> there's going to be a lot of solutions. You know, it's like like we mentioned before, it's not just these active sensors on the equi equipment. You know, it could be UAVs, it could be airplane-based imagery, satellite imagery. There's a place for for all those type of systems to provide this kind of service where you're, you know, you're being responsive to what's happened up to that point in the growing season. And, you know, in the in the next phase of this project, we're actually going to be going um, into rain fed, which that's all I, I never use that term until I moved to Nebraska because we just had land, but out there we have irrigated and dry land or rain fed. Um, I think there's a real opportunity there because you know, in irrigated is a little bit easier, we kind of control that rainfall deficit. Um, I see a lot of times driving up and down the road in dry land where there's a lot of yellow corn out there, and it's you know. We have some of these, like especially these last couple growing season out our way, the irrigated corn has yielded the same as the dry land corn in, on average in a lot of situations. But you still see so many times where somebody could have gotten a lot more yield if they had just had a little extra nitrogen. So we're, we're going to be going into that situation, which requires, I think, you got to take a look at application technique and stuff like that too. But if we're going to push the yield envelope it's it's going to be in rain fed or dry land conditions because the irrigated irrigated folks are pretty well maxing out you know yields mm -hmm. in a lot of cases in terms of water use and nitrogen use so i think there's real opportunity there to boost yields in those dry land situations and just do a better job of, of budgeting through the year a lot of times you see those deficient areas and it's not because there wasn't nitrogen out there initially it's oftentimes because it was lost through some sort, at least here in Ohio, and mm -hmm. when we get a heavy rainfall event, some of our biggest deficiency areas are due to that ponding. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> so not having that nitrogen out there, or not having as much out there, at risk of loss, I think that's right. Is a, a good place. This tool, this approach yeah. can fit. We we talk about risk, and it's always the risk is always more. What if I can't get in the field, or what if I don't get incorporating rainfall? Well, uh, a lot of times, you know, if you're especially putting out fall nitrogen how much have you risked at that point you know even in spring you know we did a we did a kind of a separate study this year just one field study but you know we put 150 pounds on it planting we split that between 75 planting 75 at v5 75 at planting 75 at v12 and the, and the all up front and v5 split were the same there was no benefit for moving that in season but when you move the that second application of v12 
you saw a lot of, of yield increase. I mean, it was 20 to 30 bushels an acre yield increase, you know, and, um, and we didn't risk that 75 pounds out there at the beginning. So I think there's a lot of, a lot of convincing to be done there. But, uh, but again, you know, you just look at that situation. It was just, it, it worked out really well with rainfall and, um, and we had a, uh, I think $50 an acre increase doing that. So timing can be very important. Well, um, we really appreciate your time. Thank you for coming to Ohio, spending the day with us. Um, it's been really interesting to hear from you. Do you want to direct our listeners to any online resources um, where they might follow up with uh, a little more information? Yeah, we well, it's always fun coming out to Ohio. I think it's about the third year in a row I've been out here this time of year, and um, always fun to catch up with folks and uh, share a little bit about what we're doing. I think that's the important thing is people are dealing with issues everywhere, and it's really really interesting to learn from you know what folks are doing here with phosphorus, and I think likewise with what others are doing with nitrogen. Um, <clears throat> yeah, if there's any interest at all, um, we have a website. Uh, precisionagriculture.unl.edu that's got some information on it. Um, really our uh, crop watch slash project sense. Uh, crop watch is kind of our uh, extension cropping systems outlet for a lot of information. Um, that's where we keep most of the project sense information housed. So um, yeah, any one of those sites. We also have our on-farm research network site that has the project sense data every year we've reported out. Um, so, you know, you can just, you can Google UNL Crop Watch, UNL On Farm Research, and, and get to most of those uh, sites through there. So, try and get as much of that information as we can out there. Great. Well, thanks again, and maybe we'll see you back in Ohio soon. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thanks for listening to the Agronomy and Farm Management Podcast. Join us again in two weeks for our next episode.